Good morning, Amago family. Listen, we invite you to join along in worship with us today. Sing along with us once you got the lyrics of this song. It's called, God has never lost a battle. He always, always fights for us. He's always there. So let's sing this song together. for you to do and your hand is moving right now you are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus and your voice is calling me out and right now I know you're able and my
worship His holy name. Sing like never before, oh my soul, I worship His holy name. Yeah. The sun comes up, it's a new day dawning, it's time to sing. Your song. How's it going, Amago? I'm Maurice, one of the pastors on staff here. And whether you're joining us in person or online, we're really excited to be with you this weekend. Um, later this month, Amago Day will be starting something new. It's called Alpha. 
Alpha is a weekly course that creates space to explore life, meaning, and faith without judgment or without all the answers. Um, if you have questions, things you're curious about, or even doubts related to God and the Christian faith, consider joining Alpha and walking through some of those questions in a community this spring. Um, also, if you have friends, neighbors, um, relatives who have those kinds of questions, you should invite them to join. Um, everyone is welcome, whether they belong to the community already or not. Um, you can get started today by filling out an interest form at idcpdx.com slash alpha. And finally, um, we're currently seeking new volunteers to serve with us um, on Sunday service. Our central city in particular needs musicians and singers to help our community in worship, both in person and online. So if you play an instrument or sing better than I do, uh, we'd love to meet you. And at our east side campus, there's a need for prayer volunteers, people to run slides. Uh, you can check out the full list of opportunities or sign up to serve at idcpdx.com slash serve. Hope you're all having a stellar week. Amago Day. It's uh, so good to be with you this Sunday after Easter. Uh, I hope you joined us for our Easter service. We had a really good turnout. Uh, I saw people come to know Jesus, which was super exciting, and just hope that you were blessed, even though it was a very different kind of Easter. Um, just a reminder that we have Alpha courses starting, which are super uh incredible little small groups where people can discover faith, ask questions about faith, journey with people together in a really casual and relaxed uh, kind of context so that people can be themselves, be where they are. And so I would encourage you to check those out uh, as they begin to ramp up. Today we're going to start a series going all the way back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis. And the reason that I think this series matters right now is that as we see sort of a post-pandemic world on the horizon, it's true that the world in a very real sense is being remade. The church is being remade. Things will never be the same in some profound ways. And so the question that many of us are asking is, what will this world look like post-pandemic? And in Genesis, we find ancient answers to very practical questions. Some of those questions are deep questions. Like in whatever world we're in post-pandemic, whose world is it? And what are we in that world for? I'm asking, how do we show up as God's people when the world itself resists God's ownership and any claim that God would make on that world? These are big questions. These are meaning-making questions that Genesis invites us not only to ask, but to seek answers to. The world of Genesis invites us into this world that is literally a God-breathed world of wonder. It's a world that is rich in God's creative action, and yet it's a world that surprisingly resists God's action, resists God himself. And while God continues to woo and to draw the world to himself, he never coerces, he never comes down hard. He is always inviting. And so God's creation is so big and so mysterious that the world of Genesis really does resist 
some of our scientific reduction that the church has done, trying to figure out if this was a literal six-day creation, but it also resists a mythological fantasy that this is just some story uh, for the ancients that has no meaning or bearing on us today. Genesis is not anti-science, nor is it anti mystery, but its origins are in God, God's word, God's work, and they create an openness for the creatures that God created to respond to God's creation. And those responses, surprisingly as we read through Genesis, and sort of not surprisingly as we think of our own lives, is that those responses are mostly about resisting God and God's desire to be with us and be with his creation. And re, but resisting is not the only response. We also find faith. And that faith shows up in unlikely characters uh, who play these foundational roles in establishing God's plan to bring his creation back to unity with its creator. This unity is seen in faith, through the lens of faith, of these characters that the story invites us to walk with. Characters who are seeking understanding, seeking to understand God and life, and an obedience that is connected to that faith that is not ever forced, and it's not coerced or manipulated, but it's doxological, meaning it is about worship. It's a faith and obedience that presents itself in the form of worship for this creator God. And so we are going to break Genesis up into a bunch of mini-series. And this first series is called The God-Breathed Life. We're looking at Genesis 1 for the next three weeks and we're going to explore both the original creation as well as the new creation of the Spirit. The Spirit is at work in creation, but the Spirit is also work in gifting the body of Christ with spiritual gifts, with attention to new creation. And so I want us to follow along as we listen to the words of Genesis 1 read over us. And my prayer is that you'll read through the book of Genesis as we go through this series, but I also want you to notice the, the poeticness of Genesis 1, the way that this poet uh, writes about the origin story of the world of God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, now the earth was formless and empty and darkness was over the surface of the deep and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light and there was light and God saw that the light was good and he separated light from darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night and there was evening and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters that separate water from water. So God made the vault and separated water under the vault from the water above it. And it was so, and God called the vault sky. And there was evening and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so, and God called the dry ground land and he gathered the water he called seas and God saw that it was good and then God said let the land produce vegetation seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to the various kinds and it was so and the land produced vegetation plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to to their kinds and God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning on the third day and God said let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night and let them serve as sign to mark sacred times and days of the year 
and let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so, and so God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. And he also made the stars. God set them in the vault of the sky to give light on earth, to govern the day and the night and to separate the light from darkness. And God saw that it was good and there was evening and there was morning on the fourth day. And God said, let the water teem with living creatures and let the birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. And so God created creatures of the sea and every living thing with which the water teems that moves about in it according to their kinds and every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the waters and the seas and let the birds increase on the earth and there was evening there was morning the fifth day and God said let the land produce living creatures according to their kind the livestock the creatures that move along the ground the wild animals each according to its kind and it was so and God made the wild animals according to their kinds the livestock according to their kinds and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds and God saw that it was good And then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness so that they may rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky, over the livestock and the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image in the image of God, he created them male and female, he created them and God blessed them and said to be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish and the sea and the birds and the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. And then God said, I give you every seed bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, and they'll be yours for food and to all the beasts of the earth and all the birds in the sky and all the creatures that move along the ground, everything that has the breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food and it was so. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. In Genesis 1, we listen to this poetic, this rhythmic, it's almost like there's a beat to it, as the creator speaks creation into being. And in the very first verses, we see the activity and the action of the Spirit That while the earth is formless and empty and darkness is over the surf of the deep, the Spirit of God is hovering over the waters. The word for spirit in Hebrew is ruach, and it's a word that means breath and a word that means wind. We hear it in Genesis 2, 7, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living being. Job speaks similarly when he says, the spirit of God has made me, the breath of the almighty gives me life. When we ask the question, brothers and sisters, why am I here? We are here because God breathed life into us and he delighted in us. We are part of a good creation and he is our creator. The good, 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 and very good of creation means that creation is not simply some activity of a God that is forced to create, but a God who is delighting in his creation. And that Humanity is the pinnacle of that creation, and the Spirit of God breathes his life into us to delight in us. We are part of a good creation. But that creation is also Trinitarian in nature, meaning that God, the God that shapes creation and the God that shapes new creation is a God who is three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. We hear this in 
1, 26. Then God said, let us make mankind in our image and our likeness. This is the first allusion to the threeness of God, the, the plurality of persons in the one God head. And what's fascinating about it is that when we think of creation as the activity of a singular God who creates the world because he needs the world to glorify him or it, then we have a God that is not the God of Genesis. That is a God who is actually not even God because God is content in himself to be God. God for all eternity was enjoying himself in the love relationship between the Father, Son, and Spirit. He had his fullness and contentment of being within himself. He didn't need creation to support his ego, to make him feel complete, to bring him glory. That all existed in the Father, Son, and Spirit. And so if the God behind creation is a community of one, e eternal in love and enjoyment of each other as three, then God didn't need creation to exist for himself. He was content in the communion of the three persons, which means that creation can only be an act of goodness, an act where the Father delights to share his goodness, and the Son creates to spread and share the Father's goodness, and the Spirit's creativity over the formless and void is shaping it into the Father's goodness and the Son's creation for our joy. And so the father dreams creation and the son architects and designs creation and the spirit displays creation. When we ask the question, why are we here? We are here because the good creator God shared his goodness with us through creation. Now, if you believe that, if, if you uh, anchor yourself in that reality, how you see the world, that we are here, one, because God breathed life into us and delighted in us, that we are part of a good creation and he is our creator. And you believe, two, that we are here because that good creator God shared his goodness with us, that this is an act of spreading the goodness of God because, of, because he is good and he delights in us, then how does that shape how we understand the world? I don't know about you, but I know for many of us right now in this pandemic moment that there is a longing within us that, that recognizes that the world is not the way it's supposed to be right now. And the question that I have is, where does that longing come from? If we just evolved from some primordial pond billions and billions of years ago without any creator or designer or good God behind that, then why is it that within us there is an ancient memory for shalom, for the way the world is supposed to be? Where does our longing for that come from? And why does it exist inside not just those of us who believe, but inside every single person? Why have we not evolved beyond that useless longing? if the world has always been this way? Or could it be that inside of us, there is an ancient memory that has been passed down through multiple generations, and that is a memory of our own genesis, 
where the Creator walked with us in the cool of the day? Could it be that that deep longing for the world to be made right when we in our lifetime have never really known the world to be right, could that longing be echoes of Eden? C.S. Lewis says this, if I find in myself desires which nothing in this world can satisfy, then the only logical explanation is that I was made for another world in mere Christianity. The way that this shapes how we see and understand the world now and in this post-pandemic reality is to know that we are part of a good God-breathed creation and that that good creator shared and delighted to spread his goodness is to let that longing for the world made right to lead you back to the creator who made you for his goodness, right? That is how we capture moments where we look out in the world and we go, this is not the way it's supposed to be, but let that longing push you back to your creator, not away from the creator. But this spirit breath of God that we see hovering over the formless and void and we see it breathe into the nostrils of Adam and Eve, we also see in the person of Jesus. We see this spirit breath of God. We know that Jesus is the creator, the son who created and was with God and was God and created all things. And in John 20, 21, after Jesus rises from the dead, he gathers and surprises the disciples. And he shows up and he says to them, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. The spirit breath of God that breathed into Adam and Eve in creation originally is now the spirit breath of Jesus, the new Adam, who is breathing his new creation life into us by the Holy Spirit. That is a powerful passage that the spirit breath the Ruach of Genesis 1 is the Holy Spirit breath of Jesus in John chapter 20. But the Spirit is also wind, that wind that is hovering over the formless and void. And in Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, he tells them, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift of my Father promised which you have heard me speak for John baptized with water but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit and if you remember the scene they're gathered in the upper room and they hear what is like a rushing wind and tongues of fire and they all are baptized with the Holy Spirit this is the spirit wind that was over the formless and void is now over these 120 disciples breathing new creation and new life into them. Why are we here? We are here to be united to the creator Jesus through his spirit. New creation, new life, spirit breathed and spirit led in new creation the father sends the son to do his will the son delights to do the father's will and then sends his disciples and these the spirit displays the son in jesus's disciples lives to bring the father glory and so creation flows from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit, to creation. And in new creation, it flows 
from the Father, through the Son, by the Spirit to us. We, the creation, live by the Spirit, through the Son, for the Father. Why are we here? We are here, brothers and sisters, because that good creator united himself to his creation in the person of Jesus. And Jesus united us to the creator by the Holy Spirit through faith. This is the God-breathed life. And while creation still pumps with the heartbeat of God and the breath of life of that original creation. Now within that old creation has come something entirely new that started on Easter and continues through the millennia to today where we are invited to live the God-breathed life of new creation. We are here so that Jesus can unite us to the Father by the Spirit. This is new creation. By the Spirit and through faith is the way we walk in step with our Creator. It's the way that the God-breathed life is lived out. And so we see from Genesis 1 up into the New Testament, from original creation to new creation, that this is a creator who is not far off, who is not distant, but who you can know personally through his new creation in Jesus. And our longing for that other world is actually being fulfilled, being satisfied as that we taste that new world by the spirit breath of God being poured out into our hearts. That spirit breath of God that is alive in us right now being poured out into our lives. We have something better. This is just a, a mind-blowing thought that we have something better than Adam and Eve had. Because Adam and Eve were with the Creator, but you and I are united to the Creator. We are united to God and sustained by His very life in Jesus. Brothers and sisters, let this be your anchor this world belongs to God and you have been united to God in Jesus. So we are invited to enjoy his creation, but, but also enjoy him. One of the beautiful things about the gospel, I got to experience this week as we were having a follow-up conversation with um, some folks that uh, tuned in to the services on Easter Sunday. And what was evident in both of their stories, just really beautiful, precious stories, is that while they, they may have had thoughts of God or believed in God uh, in a distant sense, whether through Buddhism or through other thoughts, what they were longing for was to know God personally. They were, they were actually able to articulate that. I want to know God personally. And when they understood that Jesus died for them and rose again so that we could have new life, there was something about the creator God taking on humanity, like becoming Jesus. They didn't necessarily have words for it, but there was something about the picture of a Jesus who would die on the cross for their sins and raise again so that they could know God personally that, that brought them to new life, right? It's still happening. No matter what the world is like and what world we're in, let this be your anchor that this world, pandemic or not, still belongs to God. And you have been united to God and Jesus by the Spirit. And so real quickly, recapping, why are we here? 
Well, I'm here because God breathed life into us and into creation and he delighted in us. We're part of a good creation and he is a good creator. We are here because the good creator shared his goodness with us through creation. The Father, Son, and Spirit shared their goodness with us and desired to. We are here because we have been united to the creator by the spirit of God, the spirit breath of Jesus. And we are here so that Jesus can unite us to his father. This is new creation. Now, the question that you might be asking that this is all great, Rick, but how does this help us when the pandemic is wreaking havoc on us? And, you know, as as uh As I've observed now for over a year, two things about the pandemic that I think have done, that has created or I've noticed uh, corporately as humanity. One, the pandemic has revealed the fragility of our createdness, right? This very microscopic, infinitesimal virus that is causing death and all of a sudden we are all acutely aware that there is a shelf life on us that we are not gods that we are in fact part of this genesis creation we are creatures and that that our createdness makes us fragile but the second thing that is revealed is our power and our will to live. This is the nature of creation, to live, right? God created the world and gave it life from seeds to animals to fish to air to sky to sea. That is what God breathed into us. And so death is always this uninvited stranger, unwelcome stranger, but this power and will to live that we have innately inside of us has been revealed, right? From scientists across the globe to first responders to all the medical staff to teachers to parents to volunteers, vaccination and reckoned time. And while we're not out of the woods yet, there is hope on the horizon. This fragility of our createdness and the power and will to live all point us back to Genesis, that we are created for life. We've been given the resources of life, and yet that life might be marred by death, but we bear the image of our creator with or without faith, and we participate in his purposes to bring life knowingly or unknowingly. And so the way, the way that helps us is that this is still God's world. And it is a world made for life, not death. And he calls us to spread life. The way it helps us is that the creator God has not abandoned the world, but has actually chosen to dwell within this world in us by his spirit. Which means the father wants to spread his comfort through us. So spread the Father's comfort. The spirit breath of God from creation to new creation to COVID is the same spirit that invites us to receive his goodness and spread his goodness. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us respond to the word that Pastor Rick just brought us by coming to the table of life together. So I invite you to grab your communion elements, something that um, represents the bread and then something that represents the cup. And let us just partake together um, in celebration and gratitude for what Jesus did for us on the cross. Go ahead and um, gather your elements now.
And I'll read the passage from the word of God. It says, on the night Jesus was betrayed, he took some bread and he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it to pieces and gave it to the disciples, saying, this is my body, which is given for you. So do this in remembrance of me. You may partake. And after supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this is the cup of the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed by his blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. So do this in remembrance of me. You may partake.
find comfort. 